Hello. Uh, I would like to thank everyone, first of all, for bearing with us while we dealt with some technical difficulties at the beginning of this stream. Uh, but I would like to welcome you to Artificial Intelligence and Potential Threats to U.S. Elections. My name is Brendan Quinn, and I am the Senior Communications Manager for Campaign Finance and Ethics here at Campaign Legal Center. Thank you again for joining us. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe that our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Artificial intelligence tools are increasingly becoming a part of our everyday lives. While AI can clearly be used to help workers in a number of industries, there is also a clear reason to be cautious of what can be done with this growing and largely unregulated technology. This is a fact that has not gone unnoticed by our nation's leaders, as evidenced by the sprawling executive order issued Monday by President Biden. That effort covers a wide range of sectors that AI has the potential to impact. But today, we plan to focus on one that we feel carries the utmost importance and urgency, our democratic system. AI tools are increasingly being used to design and spread fraudulent or deceptive political communications that are increasingly realistic. While this information itself is not new, AI tools provide and rapidly grow a method of misleading voters about who is speaking through political ads and can even present false information as genuine. This sort of disinformation can undermine voters' ability to assess the credibility and authenticity of political ads and other messaging that attempts to influence their vote, infringing on their fundamental right to make an informed choice at the ballot box. There is also particular concern that AI may be used to undermine the administration of elections by spreading disinformation about where and when people can vote and even who is able to vote. This directly impacts the ability of voters to participate in the democratic process and has already been seen to disproportionately target voters of color. The concerns raised by this technology are real and growing. As we prepare for the 2024 election cycle, how can we approach these challenges without regard for partisanship or political gain? I will now turn things over to Joe Deutsch, who is the Director of Legislative Strategy at CLC, to introduce the members of today's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan, and thank you, everybody, for holding on. Um, it should be a very interesting discussion today. But before we started, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. During the conversation, please use the comment section on either Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for members of the panel. At the end of the panel discussion, we will start the question and answer session. We will do our best to get to each question, um, although we started a little late today, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer all of them. If we're not able to answer and you're a member of the press, Please send us your questions at media at campaignlegal.org. And if you're a member of the public, you can send your questions to info at campaignlegal.org. Now I would like to introduce today's panel. Saurav Ghosh is Director, Federal Campaign Finance Reform at CLC, where he leads CLC's efforts to uncover campaign finance violations, file complaints seeking administrative enforcement, and pursue legislative and regulatory reforms to strengthen and ensure the consistent and robust enforcement of federal campaign finance laws. Next, I would like to introduce and welcome David Brody, Managing Attorney at the Digital Justice Initiative for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. He focuses on issues related to the intersection of technology and racial justice, such as consumer privacy, algorithmic bias, discriminatory advertising, election disinformation, free speech, online hate group activity, content moderation, and government surveillance. And finally, Amy Chang is the resident senior fellow for cybersecurity and emerging threats at R Street Institute. She has served in a number of leadership roles in the private sector on Capitol Hill and in the military aimed at addressing issues of cybersecurity and new technologies as they relate to public policy. Thank you to the members of the panel for joining us today. I'm sure this is gonna be a very interesting conversation. So let's jump right in. First question goes to Saurav. 
What is artificial intelligence as far as we're concerned here today? When did it become part of the political conversation and what is the most obvious role for AI to play in our elections? Thanks, Joe. Um, so, you know, artificial intelligence has uh, grown into something of a hot topic. Uh, and frankly, uh, it, it can affect our elections in a number of ways. Uh, I think the, the form of it that we're primarily concerned with in the election space is uh, generative AI to create uh, images, video, or audio content uh, that looks and sounds real to uh, the average person uh, seeing it used in a, in a political ad, uh, but which is in fact not real. It's, it's you know, sim synthetically made, uh, and I won't attempt to explain the technology any further than that because that's definitely not my field. Um, but we are, you know, very concerned with how this technology can be used to uh, deceive voters about who's actually speaking to them through the electoral communications that they're seeing. Uh, and we're concerned about other kinds of, of general disinformation uh, about elections, such as, you know, where and when people can vote, uh, as well as their eligibility to, to vote. So any kind of uh, AI-based disinformation is, is definitely the crux of the problem, uh, and it's one that we believe sh needs to be addressed uh, very urgently with legal reforms. Anybody want to add anything else? Sure. So so yep, go on, one, one other thing we should think about is um, AI is this huge topic, and, and some of it is generative AI, as we were talking about, but also algorithms mediate every interaction we have online. So when you're browsing Instagram or TikTok or, or Facebook or Twitter, the content you're seeing is personalized to you by an algorithm. And so when we're thinking about uh, election information, whether it's advertisements or posts or, or anything else, we have to understand that not everyone is going to see the same thing. and AI plays a role in deciding who sees what, what goes to the top of the feed versus the bottom of the feed. So, go on, Amy. Sure, I'm gonna chime in and instead of reiterating what everyone else said, um, chat about two less obvious roles that AI could play in our elections, but that I don't think they're any less important. Uh, first, that AI tools that can be used to streamline co communications for campaigns such as sending out fundraising emails, generating automated robocall messages, uh, and to what extent that's useful, it's to be determined. I don't think I've heard a single person who said that they're happy to receive campaign emails ever. Uh, so perhaps this is gonna be more of a beneficial uh, aspect to campaign staffers who no longer have to conduct very data intensive tasks to prepare and send out emails rather than the recipients of those emails. Um, but second, I think AI has also simplified, you know, in, in the same line of simplifying and streamlining tasks for business operations, the efficiencies are also seen for threat actors as well, um, who can use AI to author compelling phishing messages or, in, you know, otherwise enticing recipients of emails or texts um, to click on links or open attachments. Um, and then AI can also be used by those threat actors to search for vulnerabilities in networks um, at a much greater speed and scale as before. So, you know, like with those types of um, uses of AI by threat actors, you know, when someone successfully clicks on a link or their account or network is compromised, you then have threat actors who are able to achieve a number of different motives from financial, um, you know, that, that being, you know, like, generating a deep fake audio of your company CEO that you know wants them to conduct a financial transaction um, or on the political side using it to sow misinformation cast out on the electoral process tamper with the election infrastructure manipulate data uh, or just otherwise convincing people that um, our electoral institutions are not to be trusted so has anyone seen, I mean, we're in a primary season right now. We've got a lot of primaries next week. We're a year out from the uh, presidential. Can you give examples of any AI created political communications that you've seen so far this cycle in the forms of ads or otherwise? I mean, how do we know they're created by AI? Yeah, um, 
I'll, I'll chime in first. Um, so this cycle, we've already seen um, a number of AI generated campaign videos, um, especially in the Republican primary. Former President Trump has created deep fake videos that um, has mocked Ron DeSantis's campaign announcements. Um, and his son, Donald um, Trump Jr. has also posted deep fake videos of DeSantis. Um, and then the the Santis's campaign in June of this year was also um, known to have circulated numerous deep fake images. Um, one of the most prominent ones being President Trump hugging Dr. Fauci. Um, and uh, I think also um, when Biden re um, announced his reelection campaign, the RNC, the Republican National Committee, released a video um, featuring AI generated images depicting an apocalyptic future. Uh, with war and financial turmoil and other like types of fear mongering images that tug at concerns expressed by um, a lot of the Republican voter base. Um, some of those images and videos were labeled as generated by artificial intelligence, but others were not. Um, when when journalists and reporters confronted the campaigns on you know why it wasn't labeled, um, they kind of defended themselves by saying that it was obviously satire. You know, like why would Ron DeSantis be uh, it, it featured in the office or have a conversation with the devil. Um, so, uh, but you know, at, at that, but if you think, think about the more nuanced ways that AI generated um, images and text and audio and video are a little bit, you know, less obvious um, or not strictly satire, you know, as if they're used in campaigns and things like that, um, there are a lot of concerns um, on that front in terms of you know, making sure that the public who consumes this information understands that the information is generated, um, or the media that they're uh, that they're consuming is generated by AI. Yeah, actually, if I can dovetail off what Amy's saying, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway from what we've seen uh, in in AI uh, usage so far is that it's basically being voluntarily disclosed as generated by AI or it's sort of self-evidently fake because of what it's showing just being outlandish. And so like those aspects of the current examples really beg the question of first, what if they don't voluntarily disclose? And, and second, they are depicting something that doesn't look fake on its face that could in fact be real. And, and a couple of examples um, that sort of fall into that category uh, one ad that uh, I can never remember if it was DeSantis's campaign or the Never Back Down Super PAC that released this ad. Uh, they're they're hard to tell apart. Uh, but there was an ad where DeSantis was giving a speech, and apparently AI was used to uh, generate some military jets flying overhead. And um, the speech itself happened. The the actual uh, event was real, but footage of the event showed that there were no jets. And so that part, that that seemingly small aspect of it was generated with with AI. Um, and I think it was disclosed, but but really that's exactly the kind of situation where you're not uh, necessarily going to see that uh, openly disclosed unless there are rules in place that require such disclosure. Um, and the other example that I think really caught a lot of attention and, and raised this concern to the next level, uh, wasn't even in the, the presidential race, but in uh, Chicago's recent mayoral election, uh, it, was a, it was a video that depicted uh, an image of one of the candidates with a, an AI-generated voice of that candidate uh, saying something wildly inflammatory, something to the effect of, you know, in my day, police would kill uh, lots of people and it wouldn't be a big deal. No one would bat an eye. Completely fake, but it was depicted in a way like, uh, you know, sort of caught caught on video, hot mic kind of situation. And so you could see that, that people who hear that, uh, an AI generated voice that sounds a lot like the real person saying something, you know, uh, in a private audience, as far as how it's portrayed, uh, might actually believe that and, and might be misled. And that's the real real problem here. And, and building off of that, I think there, there's also a, a risk from the, the negative space here, which is the fact that we don't know what content is AI generated or not 
provides an opportunity for uh, partisans or bad actors to allege that real content is actually fake. And we now have this situation where uh, there is not agreement on ground truth reality because unless you are actually there in person, you don't necessarily know what is real or not. And sometimes some actors have incentive to say that something is fake when it's real or real when it's fake. So David, continuing on with that, can you talk a little bit about how AI can be used to target specific groups of voters, um, increasing existing inequities in the election process? Sure, absolutely. So I think one example that from the recent past that, that we wanna think about how it could be supercharged now is we know that in the 2016 election, uh, Russian influence operations specifically targeted black voters with disinformation for the purposes of trying to suppress the vote. And that, that was reported in the, the Senate Intelligence Committee's uh, reports. And so that operation was very costly, involved a lot of people, but the new AI tools allow anyone with a computer or cell phone to undertake these types of operations potentially at scale. And, and so that's really dangerous. We're, we're talking about putting into the hands of, of everyone the ability to wage disinformation campaigns. One of our recent cases uh, from 2020 was uh, a lawsuit, uh, National Coalition on Black Civic Participation versus Wool. Uh, this is a case where some, a couple bad actors sent 85,000 misleading and racist robocalls targeted to black voters to try to dissuade them from voting. Those 85,000 robocalls cost only $1,000 to send. And the, the court ultimately held that this violated the Voting Rights Act. But imagine if the same scenario happens next year, uh, bad actors could synthesize more authentically fake information to put into robocalls, to put into targeted ads, which if they happened, you know, as an October surprise on the eve of an election, there might not be time to debunk what is real or not real before people are, are uh, dissuaded or defrauded from their right to vote. So all three of you have now given some very good examples of manipulation of voters and how elections can be undermined. Amy, can you talk a little bit about next steps um, that federal, state, and local governments can take to ensure our election infrastructure is safe and secure? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm given my expertise more in the federal space, I'm gonna like uh, defer on the state level action, but I do know that uh, numerous states have passed um, different types of legislation or are in the process of deliberating um, different pieces of legislation and regulation for, um, you know, proper labeling of AI media or AI generated media. Um, but there are also a number of attempts at the national level to address the concerns that AI generated media pose, uh, poses. So um, in just this year alone, in May, we had legislators in both the House and the Senate introducing legislation that would require a disclaimer of political ads that use images or video generated by AI. And then in August, um, the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, also asked for comments on a proposal to amend its regulation, <clears throat> excuse me, that prohibits a candidate or any agent from um, fraudulently misrepresenting other candidates or political parties through the use of AI-generated ads. Um, and then um, Senators Schatz and Kennedy also, I think just about a week ago, introduced legislation to re require clear labeling for generative AI media uh, and for identifying AI-generated content late October, uh, This this, this just, just in October. Um, and then, um, this week, too, um, President Biden has also released its executive his executive order on AI um, that has a provision for the Department of Commerce to develop standards for detecting and labeling AI generated content. Um, one last thing that I'll mention um, before I turn it over to others is 
Um, Senator Schumer has been also holding these AI insight forums. He's already had four to date. And then he announced uh, that next week he'll have another one that's dedicated to election security. Yeah, I, I think all of those uh, efforts, I think, as I said at the, the top of my remarks, AI is a hot topic. And uh, it's good to see that because it it's a fast moving target. Um, a year ago, no one that I knew of was talking about AI in any context. Uh, and now it seems like it's uh, a, an emerging topic in, in a variety of, of contexts. Um, as some may know, uh, our CLC's president, Trevor Potter, gave some testimony before the Senate Rules Committee recently and outlined uh, essentially a number of policy solutions for the elections context. Uh, and I'll, I'll just touch on two of them here, one being a ban on deceptive uses of AI in electoral communications. Uh, as Amy mentioned, the FEC does have a pending rulemaking petition right now that deals with fraudulent misrepresentation. But you know, the, given the, the scope of the statute, which the FEC can't change, uh, that's necessarily a limited solution. And so it's um, it would be better for Congress to simply tackle the issue uh, from scratch and, and basically prohibit deceptive AI uh, from being used to manipulate or, or deceive voters, um, both in terms of how they're voting and in terms of their ability to vote. And then sort of as a backstop to that, a second uh, congressional solution um, would be to require any ads that use AI to provide a disclaimer of that fact so that voters seeing those ads would be uh, aware that what they're seeing is, you know, partially or, or wholly generated with AI and, um, you know, have be, be better equipped to evaluate those ads, which is kind of one of the fundamental goals of campaign finance law. And, and just to, to put a finer point on that, because I think there's a, there's an aspect here that, that a lot of people don't realize most of the, the federal voting rights laws, so the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1957, the KKK Act of 1871, when they have provisions that prohibit voter intimidation, they generally require threats, force, or intimidation to, to count as, a, as, a, as voter suppression. The federal voting rights laws generally do not apply to merely deceiving someone out of their right to vote. You have to get a little bit creative with federal law to to enforce against those violations. And so, you know, this has been something that that Lawyers Committee as well has supported for for years is uh, passing de uh, a prohibition on deceptive voter suppression. Uh, it was a component of the the John Lewis voting rights law that has been introduced and reintroduced a couple of times. Um, and similarly, on the the labeling requirements that that Amy was talking about it's really tricky to, to implement because there are really thorny First Amendment questions that have to get navigated. Um, anytime you're talking about something like labeling political speech, you have a First Amendment question. You're, you're doing a, a, con a content specific speech regulation. Um, that's not to say it can't be done. We, we require disclosures on campaign ads, the whole like, you know, I support this message type of disclosures. Um, but it means that it has to be very carefully written in a way that can survive uh, what's known as strict scrutiny. It can be done, but it's hard. Yeah, actually, on, on both of points, David, if I can you know, just say that I, I really didn't know the point about uh, voting rights and, and requiring suppression and uh, or, or violence. That's really interesting. One of the examples I've often used about how AI could be used to suppress votes uh, is, you know, let's let's not talk even a political figure, you know, just someone who has a lot of, uh, for lack of a better term, street cred, uh, like a LeBron James or The Rock, you know, you generate a convincing enough AI version of them, uh, and it looks like a PSA, a, a public service message, and uh, that says something to the effect of, you know. Uh, in case in case you weren't aware, it's a felony to vote uh, if you've ever had a prior criminal conviction. And I mean, a lot of people just don't know any better. And, and it's coming from someone they like and, and trust to speak truth to them. 
that's a very scary scenario where that's you know not really covered by by any law or or even more mundane examples you could have uh, a fake text message or email or call saying hey this is the local election office there's been a flood at the polling place come back tomorrow mm, yeah and i'll also say i think absent greater um, federal government action um, or direction on this issue, you're leaving a lot of industry to kind of make these decisions on their own, um, which then may set them up for types of legal scrutiny um, in terms of like what what types of business decisions they try, they try to make. Um, I know Google, Meta, well, Meta in, in 2020 announced that they would um, remove any sort of misleading, manipulated media. Um, Google and YouTube um, said that they would do some sort of like labeling on political ads that are generated by AI. Um, but, you know, as we've also seen from um, a lot of things happening on, on the Senate side and the, and the House side in terms of scrutiny over Twitter, which is now X and their um, the, the types of information that are posted on the, that platform, as well as CISA, um, which is the Cybersecurity and, and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, having a role in trying to combat misinformation and disinformation and like butting heads with the, the potential for infringement on um, First Amendment rights and, and the freedom to express yourself. So like drawing that fine line puts a lot of, um, a lot of additional scrutiny on the private sector uh, in terms of you know, how they make their business decisions in terms of labeling um, and things like that. And can I make one quick point? You know, both of you have mentioned the uh, kind of constitutional considerations around, uh, well, both labeling and, and prohibiting uh, AI based speech. And I think that's obviously a, a valuable point because, you know, we have a First Amendment. It's important to take into consideration. Um, but it's it's really about how these things are defined. As as David, as you said, you know, our political ads already require disclaimers. There's absolutely no uh, no serious question about their constitutionality. Uh, and even in the context of uh, fraudulent misrepresentation, you know, there that law has been on the books for decades. And you know, the Supreme Court has said on on several <laughs> occasions that there's really no First Amendment right to fraudulent speech. Uh, and particularly in this uh, core area of, you know, deceiving voters or, or manipulating them, um, really these kinds of requirements enhance the First Amendment value of ensuring that voters have uh, their right to participate in our democracy upheld, uh, and that they're able to do so in a meaningful way by actually uh, knowing who's speaking to them through political ads. So it's it's important to keep the constitutional point in mind, but I, I don't think it's a a barrier to federal regulation in this in this area. So before we come back to possible solutions and legislation, Sarab, do you want to talk a little bit about um, foreign entities involved in AI, how foreign actors could be illegally involved um, and involving themselves in our elections? We haven't really touched on that yet. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as as David mentioned earlier in 2016, uh, and this was you know well documented in the Mueller report, uh, the Russian operation to try and, and manipulate uh, the presidential election was often using sort of uh, fault lines uh, in in the American uh, political space to to try and manipulate the election. Uh, that was an an overt foreign influence operation. Um, it just didn't use AI. So now, you know, the same type of operation just has new tools. And I, I'm unfortunately uh, in the position of saying that's already been documented. There was a report that came out recently uh, that said um, ch the Chinese have already been uh, caught using AI in, to influence uh, American voting uh, and and I think it's going to increase. You know, it's it's as as some of us have been saying. You know, it's it's a way that influence can be uh, more surreptitious and and easier. It's it's cheaper than a sort of large scale uh, influence operation. So uh, the the incentives are all the same, but the tools are getting more powerful and and easier to use. And I think one thing we should keep an eye on in this space is 
what we're seeing over the last couple of election cycles is while there is a foreign influence operation presence, the majority of election disinformation is domestic. The majority of, of harmful content seeking to disenfranchise voters is created right here at home by people that don't want other people to vote. So David, talk a little bit about other measures that we can do um, to help the situation. What, what are some of the other solutions, legislation um, that we should really be moving on now? Sure. So, you know, we've seen the speed of technological advancement outpace the output of our democratic institutions in a lot of ways, uh, all during an especially critical moment for the health of our democracy and the safety of black and brown Americans in, in particular. Um, we're heartened by the, the president's recent executive order on AI that came out on Monday and uh, implementation guidance from the Office of Management and Budget came out yesterday. There's efforts by, by NIST to study AI standards and disclaimers and transparency, as was previously mentioned. But there's a couple really big gaps on the legislative side. The first is we do not have a comprehensive privacy law in the United States. And that is really important because the way in which we manage data, protect data, collect, use, share data is all upstream from how AI uses data. And so we, we need data protections that can choke off the raw material and fuel for the fire. Um, particularly as we're thinking about how AI is trained and tested for, for bias and discrimination, we need a regime in place that allows sensitive demographic information, race, sex, and whatnot, to be shared with companies that are trying to develop responsible AI products, while at the same time giving consumers confidence that that highly sensitive personal information is not going to get used for secondary purposes, is going to be protected and secured against data breaches and identity theft and things like that. Just like how when you go to the doctor, you feel confident sharing your highly sensitive medical information because you know that there is a federal law, HIPAA, that prevents the doctor from disclosing that information for other purposes. And so you're able to have a productive conversation with your doctor to get care. We also need those types of protections in the online space so that we can use information in a safe and productive way without feeling like we have to constantly be on guard against all the ways it can be used against us. So, so for that reason, you know, we've been really promoting a, a, a federal privacy legislation as a really integral first step for transparency, security, data minimization, anti-discrimination pr protections. Um, in the AI space in particular, we need a few more things. We need uh, civil mm -hmm. rights protections that prohibit algorithmic discrimination and require pre and post deployment impact assessments to audit algorithmic systems for bias and potential harms. We need duty of care provisions that require AI systems to be safe and effective before they are deployed and through post deployment monitoring including protections against deceptive marketing, unfair and, dece and dangerous practices, off-label uses, things like that. And we need transparency and explainability provisions that tell people when an AI is affecting them, explain how a the AI works, and require disclosures that provide information about the system. And then finally, we're going to need an oversight and enforcement regime, including a, a federal regulator that really has the tools to go after this, as well as uh, there's a role for state attorney generals to engage in enforcement. And there needs to be a private right of action so that when an individual has their rights violated, they can go to court and, and get vindication. To kind of build off of what, yeah, sorry, um, to, to build off of what David said, I think, um, you know, to, we're, we, we're starting to make steps in the right direction, but I think we need to more holistically engage our elected officials and policymakers in understanding the direction that the, that the technology is heading uh, and how it will impact how they govern, as well as just educating them about the technologies in general and, and like what they're actually coping with. So then, then they can more effectively be able to legislate or regulate it. 
Um, and then at the same time, you know, that all of these laws that would protect voter rights um, would be would be underscored. I think we would also need to pursue greater voter education and engagement in the democratic process that you know allows them to continue to have vested trust in our institutions. Um, and I think that's that's going to be vital as well. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to um, outside questions in the little time we have left. Um, we have one already from Klaus on YouTube, and he asked, will the executive order um, that was mentioned, signed by Biden, already have an impact on the campaign? Sure, I can, I can answer that. So uh, the short answer is probably not, not directly, but indirectly it might. Uh, the executive order from President Biden is targeted primarily to the federal government's own use of AI. Uh, it does instruct federal agencies with various enforcement jurisdictions to look at how their own tools can be used to prevent harms resulting from AI. But for the most part, I don't think any of the provisions in the executive order are specific to election information. Uh, and someone should correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Federal Election Commission is not subject to the executive order. I don't think they're a covered agency. So no, I didn't see anything about, about them. I, I spend most of my time worrying about what the FEC can and can't do. Uh, right. <laughs> Uh, so the short answer is I don't think the executive order will uh, directly address it, but the, the, the way in which the executive order sets out a whole of government response to AI will have knock on effects that should beneficially uh, uh, address this ecosystem in terms of things like NIST getting more involved with setting standards and recommendations, the Commerce Department studying the labeling issues and things like that. I'll just add to be a little more for, forceful on the point that, you know, an NEO is a good start, but Congress needs to do something. This isn't something that uh, President Biden can fix with, uh, you know, the authority that he has. This is going to require some specific legislation. And so that's why we're, we're advocating for Congress to do that. So I apologize um, to people who have questions that we're going to have to hold off. But again, if you have questions, please send them to us if you're the media. It's media at campaignlegal.org. And if you are um, part of the public, please send your questions to info at campaignlegal.org. We're gonna spend the last few minutes that we have with some closing thoughts from our three guests um, to leave us with some idea of predictions and how potential threats to US elections pose a real threat to um, our elections. So. Amy, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I think I'm hopeful that we've learned from previous elections, not to be, you know, like since we spent the last hour um, on like doing a lot of doom and gloom. <laughs> um, and we've gathered information and intelligence uh, through our previous elections to hopefully adequately allocate resources to ensure that our elections are protected and secured. Um, I think that is why we're seeing so much more action on behalf of policymakers as we enter the 2024 election cycle. Um, I think, unfortunately, the openness of our country is also why we are so susceptible to interference, um, confusion, and other types of malicious behavior. So technological advances in social media have also amplified the opportunities for encroachment on, on the democratic process. Uh, and I think the 2024 election will serve as a perfect des test bed for malicious actors, be they domestic or foreign, to leverage these novel technologies to deploy against our uh, electoral process. With that said, though, I think it is imperative that we take any measures necessary to ensure the security and integrity of our election infrastructure, going back to kind of the original, um, my opening remarks in terms of, um, you know, ensuring that not just, you know, the, the material and the media that is generated from AI, but the potential other effects that AI could impact on our election infrastructure, networks and systems um, to make sure that citizens know that, that those um, elements of our elections remain trustworthy and viable and not to overlook um, the cyber risks that will persist while we're focused on things like generative AI. Great, thank you. David? I, so 
I am maybe cautiously optimistic, maybe cynical, uh, that there's a chance that that uh, these developments will lead people to stop trusting everything they see on the internet and and seek out authoritative sources if, if we get to a place where we really can't trust anything. Um, but one thing I, I want us to keep in mind is that behind AI is people. It, it's the data of real people that's trained it. It's real people that program it and instruct it on how to operate. And it's companies run by real people who make the choice to put out into the world a dangerous product. And so as these technologies create new risks, we need to hold accountable the companies that are choosing to put a car on the road with no brakes. We don't allow in many other aspects of commerce products to, to enter the marketplace when they are unsafe. And we need to uh, not treat this as if, you know, the, the, the machine just has a life of its own. Real people at real companies are making choices to make these products available in the way in which they are currently built. That's very well said. I'll, I'll make mine short. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. I think the, there's a good news, bad news dynamic here. The good news is that we have a lot of ideas about what can be done to you know, hold people accountable and uh, put some guardrails on this thing. Um, the bad news is that the folks that are going to put up those guardrails uh, are policymakers, legislators, uh, executives of companies. So sort of the groups of people who, at least, you know, in, in today's climate, uh, seem deeply dysfunctional and, and incapable of making uh, those choices in, in a timely manner. Um, so I think it's great that we're uh, motivated and having these conversations because we are sort of collectively afraid of what might happen. Um, but it, it would be a break with current patterns of behavior to see Congress actually pass something, you know, in, in the next 12 months or so that we have. Um, I'd love to be wrong about that, but we'll see. Well, thank you, Sarav, Amy, and David for your insight. Um, this was really remarkable. Um, thank you for your patience and thank you for everybody who joined us today for hanging on through our beginning technical problems, which were not AI um, related, I should add. Um, and we hope everybody has a good day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.